Hello YouTube, my name is Mikamu, and today we'll do something that no one has ever done. We'll be talking about the ending to Mass Effect 3. <laughs> so if I'm being honest, I was really torn about doing this, um, because I know this is something that has been talked about by everyone forever, but I am a really big fan of the franchise. And given how central discussing the ending tends to be within the fandom, I figured that I put my own two cents out there. Partly because I know at the end of the day, I, think, I guess Mass Effect fans will not stop talking about the ending, regardless of how much people may want that to be the case. And I feel that both defenses and attacks of the ending, they tend to be kind of lacking in my view. And so I want to, if we're going to talk about this, I, I want to elevate the level of discussion about what is, you know, arguably one of the most central aspects of people's experience with Mass Effect, for better or for worse. Uh, this is actually a re-recording of my script. I wrote this back in September and recorded in early October um, with a plan to release this on N7. But after listening to the amazing documentary by People Make Games, um, interviewing the staff of Mass Effect 3, or a few of the staff members, about the decision to rewrite the ending. I figure I'd re-record parts of this to take that into account, providing better context around that. But the purpose of this video is mostly analyzing the ending from a storytelling perspective. I do understand that discussion is inextricably linked with the questions of the environment in which these writers were producing the content, right? Um, when you hear about the crunch conditions, for example, I know gamers don't like to think about the conditions under which games are made, but you can't help but think, you know, had these people had more time, they could more thoroughly plot out inconsistencies and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, with that said, you might first be wondering, you know, who the hell am I? What gives me a license to even talk about a story like Mass Effect? Admittedly, I'm just a guy that modded Mass Effect this summer. Other than that, I'm an amateur sci-fi writer. I write stories all the time. And I really like going through thought exercises that sharpen my understanding of narrative structure and themes and all that jazz, all the good things that make up storytelling. And so that's mostly why I want to do this. It's not to tear down the writers. It was really just, I found myself as a fan of this franchise, being disappointed with the ending and being a writer, I wanted to really understand what it was. And I, I feel that for, some people who are genuinely curious about why people keep bringing up the ending. I hope that this discussion at least talks about that. And not from a perspective, again, of tearing down the writers or whatever. It's literally just looking at the storytelling conventions and seeing where exactly the audience's suspension of disbelief may kind of come apart based off of previously established aspects of the lore and the story. Um, I haven't seen anyone really provide this, this analysis, despite the fact that, you know, I know everyone and their mother has talked about this ending to death. There is maybe one person who has, a Seamus Young, a 20-sided, he um, has a column there. He wrote back in, I believe, 2015, a really long tome, just a long retrospective on the entire trilogy. And this analysis technically considers Mass Effect 3 dead on arrival. Basically, Seamus' argument is that Mass Effect 2's structure so thoroughly bogged down uh, Mass Effect 3 that uh, Mass Effect 3 really couldn't do what it was setting out to accomplish at all. I don't know that I completely agree with him. I am sympathetic to that argument. I'm genuinely more interested in looking specifically at Mass Effect 3's ending kind of from a standalone story perspective, right? Within the story of Mass Effect 3, how well is this self-contained story? Obviously, we'll be talking about the trilogy in here and some of the themes that the trilogy sets up, but I think Mass Effect 3's ending kind of, if you say fails, it kind of fails on its own merits. Um, and you don't have to say that uh, Mass Effect 2 structure necessarily damned it. But if you are interested in some of the discussion of weaknesses in Mass Effect 2's plot, I do actually briefly touch upon those in a review of a mod called Risky Suicide Mission. This is a mod by a uh, fan named Stumble. He created the mod earlier this year. 
I don't think the mod's gotten as much attention as it deserves because it came out literally right before Legendary Editions. But this is a mod that reimagines the suicide mission. Um, there are some random elements, there's some dynamic elements, but this isn't a review of that mod. So if you want to hear me talk about that mod, as well as what I think some of the structural weaknesses of Mass Effect 2's story um, are, you can check out the review of that mod, as well as a playthrough of the entire original trilogy, heavily modded in my Mods Effect trilogy playlist. I'll link that in the description, as well as some other stuff. Um, so with that all said, let's go into some disclaimers. First, we're going to be looking at specific storytelling elements like world building, lore, theme, narrative structure uh, within the ending. And we're going to show how these are inconsistent with the content that came before it. Now, you might be asking, what does it mean to be inconsistent? I think if one thing writing is about consistency and the rules of writing, while they're not ironclad, these rules are essential to the audience's expectation. It's true that writers break rules all the time, but if rules aren't broken deliberately or for a good trade-off, you'll get very angry readers or listeners or, you know, whatever medium your story is being told through, you'll get angry audience members. And this cycle has repeated itself more times than you can fathom. TV, which is a more mature medium than video games, provides ample examples of this. Uh, for example, going back to the 70s, St. Elsewhere is a TV show that the finale really didn't jive with people for reasons that are kind of really dumb. My mom was telling me, you know, when she was a kid, she heard people literally calling the radio station the day after the finale, complaining about the ending, Lost, Game of Thrones, Dexter, so many examples. And it's usually the case, you know, although not always, that when an ending disappoints people, there are structural and narrative reasons for this. And that's not to say that every person expressing disappointment and the ending will articulate the exact same reasons for why they're disappointed. But usually you can draw a line between the rules that were broken and, and why the audience really received the ending poorly. So whether or not you personally like an ending obviously comes down to your willing suspension of disbelief. And that's something that can't be taken away from you, um, regardless of what other people might believe. But wh what I'm hoping to show you is why the endings, you know, even the extended cut, why they eroded that suspension of disbelief for so many people. And you no, know, it's not just because Shepard dies in two of the endings. And the question of, you know, obviously whether or not the disappointment is justified is not the point of the video. And I, d I think it goes without saying this video is obviously not a defense of the bit toxic uh, campaign that the internet went on back in 2012. Um, I think there is a fine line between constructive criticism, which I'm hoping to provide, um, and uh, harassment, toxicity, etc. I hope, you know, if you are a fan who felt disappointed by the ending, maybe you'll get a better appreciation for why you feel that way. If you're a fan who is curious as to why people keep bringing this up, hopefully this provides possibly one of the more detailed reasons or analyses as to why um, some fans felt this way. If you wanted to skip ahead to the main points I make, there are timestamps in the video description, but this will be a fairly long video. With that all said, let's just jump right in and get some popcorn. And if you're willing to listen, let's begin. So originally this section had me covering uh, the historical context around the original endings released back in 2012 before the extended cut update. But I felt a little bit awkward about doing that Partly because I didn't play Mass Effect back then. I'm a newer fan, much newer fan, in fact. And also, in light of the amazing documentary by People Make Games, I figure that um, I bet better just link you to that video and cut that section to get you know fuller context to understand the original controversy. But suffice it to say, given the impact of the original ending sometimes when people complain about that ending, they still have the feelings and the implications of, of all that still in their mind. I do want to highlight, I think, at least in, in my mind, as someone who played the, the trilogy in 2019, it was pretty obvious that Mass Effect 3 as a whole was subjected to crunch. You know, I had heard that before I played the franchise, but you just see the craftsman-like quality of Mass Effect 1 and 2, and three is a very streamlined experience. Lots of auto dialogue here. Um, 
less dialogue overall, right? It, it's sort of like a more kind of conveyor belt -y version of Mass Effect. And, you know, so earlier I said that the conditions that developers find themselves working in, you know, it's undoubtedly just linked to game quality. I think Mass Effect 3 is pretty much a case for that. At, at that point, you know, when you're kind of deep in that kind of crunch, um, the only thing you can think about is finishing the game, regardless of the amount of detail you might want to pay to things or whatever, right? You just don't have the luxury, the leisure to to think about every single plot implication, every single variation. You just need to get it done because you're just meeting an uh, objective, a deadline, whatever. Those are the types of sacrifices that end up happening when after weeks and weeks of crunch, you just have to deliver something. Um, it's just not humanly possible to to optimize a game story in conditions like that. And I mean, if you need more evidence, I mean, we, we learned this lesson in last year with Cyberpunk 2077, right? Obviously there's a balance between making games vaporware and, and never releasing them and crunching developers. I, I hope that uh, the industry at some point learns a better balance. So getting off my soapbox, I have an entirely different context for the endings as I said. I first played the trilogy back in 2019, the summer of 2019. I, I'd just been laid off. I had sick family. It was not really a good time for me personally. And, you know, I was going through this. I was also playing through a backlog of Steam games that I hadn't gotten to. And I finally reached Mass Effect 1 in August of that year. To say that I was hooked is definitely an understatement. The world building for Mass Effect is phenomenal. I don't think I've seen very many video games with this level of detail in terms of world building. This meant that the immersion level was really high as well. The characters, of course, are well written and they are very clearly the soul of the trilogy. They are incredibly lifelike. They are, for all intents and purposes, when you think of them, your best friends. Despite the fact that, you know, Mass Effect is pretty much a linear story that just happens to have branching narratives. And with that all in mind, this makes the trilogy all the more impressive. Even if we don't like certain parts of the story or the trilogy as a whole, it's undoubtedly the case that what the developers did across all three games is phenomenal. Um, making people feel like their choices matter. You know, there are entire variations of Shepard and, and characters that I just haven't experienced in my now two playthroughs of the trilogy. So whatever you think of the ending and whatever you think of the writers or whatever, this in, in and of itself is a impressive, dare I say a massive feat. And it's one that is worth highlighting and touting because I think it's the reason why we're all Mass Effect fans. This is a very good example of how video games can be art, can be stories, etc. But with that all said, even in 2019, with all the distance from the quote unquote debacle that was the original ending, I was disappointed. And I think part of that is because the ending was jarring. It left many unanswered questions. Something didn't really fit. And now that's not to say that everything up until the ending was perfect. For example, if you consider the plans of the Reapers across all three games, they're fairly inconsistent, even self-defeating between each game. So Sovereign's attempt to open up the Citadel Relay is ultimately irrelevant. And in fact, you know, had the Reapers been rational antagonists, they would have just flown from Dark Space at the beginning of Mass Effect 1, like they did at the end of Mass Effect 2, and they would have just rained down on every single world, right? Because the fact that at the end of Mass Effect 2, they had the capability of just flying from Dark Space means that Sovereign's plan was pretty pointless. It's actually the reason why the galaxy knew about the Reapers in the first place. So... Stuff like that apparently means that maybe Mass Effect as a series shouldn't have happened if the Reapers were rational antagonists. And obviously, like, the implication is that there is a, a disconnect between between the plot points of the various games, right? Um, so stuff like this kind of illustrated to me that maybe the story themes are being stretched in at some points. And, and as... A long-running franchise as writers a long-running franchise you know obviously it's hard to catch every single continuity error that happens right so i'm not blaming anyone for this but oversights like this maybe should have served as a warning for the community to kind of tamper their expectations 
But th that's sort of the tricky thing with suspension of disbelief. I think once your audience no longer has it, they'll start seeing flaws like this uh, everywhere in your game or story. Um, the only reason why I even thought of this Reaper inconsistency is because the ending was was confusing to me and it made me think more about the franchise. And then all of a sudden it's like, ah, you know, whack-a-mole, all these other continuity areas kind of pop up in my head. Um, so you might be asking, you know, okay, if Mass Effect has some of these kind of gaffes, you know, what makes the ending so special if, if all these other types of issues exist? And I think the simple fact is because the ending has been talked about so much, it's like an infamous part of the fandom's collective experience. Um, there are enough fans that have been disappointed by the endings, and I think it will continue to be a sticking point for the fandom, you know, even as new fans like myself kind of come in and, and experience the same feelings. And I don't, I don't think that'll ever change. So I think, you know, hopefully um, a video like this can provide a more constructive way of, of looking at what reasons there might be around seeing the ending um, and kind of being kind of thrown off guard. Um, so in some ways, this is the defense of, you know, some fans' constructive criticisms of the ending. And in some ways, this is an extension to have a dialogue about what it is that we kind of expect from a story, what it is that we like about a story. And then the third part, obviously, is me having a little bit of fun doing a thought exercise, thinking through a story that I like and, and trying to understand why it is that I... Uh, lost my suspension of disbelief. So if you're listening to this, um, I hope it serves as an uh, introduction to storytelling logic or hell, maybe even encourage you to uh, think critically about other types of stories that you might enjoy, maybe even write your own story. I don't know. Um, but with that all said, let's jump right in. So as I said before, if there's one word that kind of describes the ending to me, I think it's jarring, disjointed would be another close uh, synonym. And all of this stems from the catalyst. I know I'm not covering any new ground here, but the catalyst is really central to the ending. So inevitably, we're going to have to talk about its role in all of this. Let's first run through the problems that the catalyst either introduces or makes worse from a narrative and storytelling perspective. By the way, this will kind of serve as the outline for the video. So just to give you a high level overview. So first thing is the catalyst is very poorly integrated into the world of Mass Effect. Um, I think aside from the tiny bit of lore we get from Leviathan DLC, that explains that the uh, Le Leviathans created the Catalyst. Players aren't really allowed to know how the Catalyst works and most crucially, why it reasons the way it does. The Catalyst reasons very poorly and players obviously will be in contention with the philosophy or lack thereof, I guess, of the Catalyst. So if you're not gonna be able to debate the Catalyst, I think one other way that players can get some sort of solace or some sort of uh, sense of resolution is if they could at least know the events that led to the catalyst kind of becoming the way it 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 did right but we don't get we don't get either of these things and for a series that prides itself on providing world building for the tiniest minutia of, of the universe it's kind of weird to see that the catalyst treated this way because the catalyst has shaped the entirety of mass effect's universe right the present day of mass effect as it is was influenced by the catalyst decision and its point of view so as a result it's kind of bizarre to see so little information provided about the catalyst and i think for this reason you know to this day even among fans who agree about the quality of the ending there are major differences in how they interpret the events that are happening and this isn't because the writing is is clever or it's it's intriguing it's because the writers have kind of left it up to the players to fill in the gaps. For example, does the synthesis ending restore sentience to husk and other organics that were harvested? Um, I don't really know. I've seen arguments going either way. I mean, obviously, um, in the ending of synthesis, you get a, a clip of a husk kind of scaring at the screen like uh, that freaking sudden clarity meme from 2012. Um, um, uh, so is this husk alive? Um, I don't know. It could just be that, you know, it's not evil anymore, but it has no personality, uh, or maybe the original personality returned. I've seen people argue both ways, but it's a question that you would want answered before you click on the synthesis button, right? Because a world in which husks are alive is like, 
kind of different from a world in which just machines and he humans are kind of just chilling out, right? Like Tusk are beings that have been psychologically tortured. Them coming back to life is kind of like almost a terrifying prospect. But I've seen, you know, I've seen arguments that they're not alive. You know, I've seen arguments that, you know, they are alive and, and, and Bioware put them, you know, at the ending to make you feel regret for choosing synthesis. And the fact that this kind of remains is sort of like, I think just part and parcel of the confusion that still lingers about these endings. Um, I'm not even sure if all the staff agree of what's happening either. There should be some degree of, of thought provoking occurrences in the ending, right? But not to the extent where it's just, you know, things are happening on screen and we don't really have an explanation for them. And this is kind of the reason why disproven theories like indoctrination theory, um, often abbreviated as IT, persist to this day. The writers have jossed this theory to borrow, you know, terminology from TV tropes. They, they said it's not true. Um, but for many people, IT remains probably the best fit explanation for them because there's just a bunch of stuff that the writers haven't um, clarified or that the ending doesn't clarify. And, um, you know, at least with your own fan theory, right, you can kind of take the incongruities and kind of spin them together in a way that makes sense to you. Um, so the alternative to IT is for some fans is to just not have any explanation and, you know, and uh, kind of remain in that confusion. So I think the fact that this confusion remains to this day uh, is just illustrative of, of uh, the fact that these endings have this degree of of kind of uh, jarringness, right? That they don't really necessarily flow well together with what came before in, in the series. Um, and this example I gave of, 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 you know, the husk coming back to life is not the only example. There's other instances of it in the ending, for example, you know, how did the elusive man get to the Citadel so quickly when you had to fight through literal ar armadas of Reapers to get to that point, right? You could argue, oh, the Reapers let him in, but even you would expect some friendly fire or some sort of background like fighting to at least interfere with his ability to get to the Citadel. For the most part, this video is going to focus on questions surrounding the catalyst mostly. But this is an example of there are a variety of questions like this that kind of require players to form their own headcanon to get through uh, the confusion. Um, so the second major point is there's not really much in the game of lore providing examples of what the Catalyst is talking about, providing examples of organic and machine conflict. You know, granted, all these conflicts took place in the far past of Mass Effect's uh, history, but the writers clearly understand the importance of lore, as I will explain later in the video. And this isn't just a missed opportunity. Again, it highlights that the Catalyst feels like it doesn't belong in the world of Mass Effect. The third point is ultimately the theme of conflict with synthetics. It represents a major tone shift from earlier parts of the trilogy. There's also some whiplash regarding this theme within Mass Effect 3 as a standalone story. I think making it overall one of the weaker entries in the trilogy. But even if we assume that the theme of synthetic and organic conflict is central to the entire trilogy, which I think previous entries indicate that it's not, the players really should have no expectation that solutions provided by the Catalyst solve this problem. And then finally, the ending creates a huge structural narrative shift. The Catalyst is very clearly a deus ex machina, um, a literal god entity that would be home in the kind of you know genre of a mythology or a fantasy story. So this creates a major tone shift that is uh, kind of, again, jarring uh, for the player. But that's not the only thing that matters. The other thing is that because Shepard is choosing from a set of options provided by the Catalyst, and because Shepard cannot shape these choices in any way, the nature of Shepard's agency changes drastically at the ending. So that's the final point. These points were made in order of least important to most important, but we'll start from the top and work our way down. Okay, so maybe I'm a little slow, but it took me some time to really understand what was going on at the end of Mass Effect. I think that's because of my expectation that the series would provide more explanation as to why the Catalyst came to its reasoning, as I was saying before. There's this just question that is in, I think, most players' mind. Why is it saying these things? And, and you know, if I can't argue with it, how did it come to get so messed up, right? 
with that in mind, there's this broader question of where does this expectation of having explanation come from? Did it come from nowhere? Um, no, Mass Effect is a RPG and it's a space opera. These are two genres that really excel at creating worlds that are rich with detail and they go into exposition sometimes, you know, at inappropriate times. But one of the things you can expect from these genres is to know what is going on to the finest level of detail. So exposition dumps are not uncommon in games like this or in stories like, you know, movies or, or books or TV shows that are space operas. So given the two genres that Mass Effect is straddling, you would really expect to have some level of knowledge going into this discussion with the Catalyst as to if not, you know, like why it's thinking it the way it is, the history of the Catalyst beyond who made it. And obviously the ending does not give us this. In earlier games, usually if you don't know what's going on, you can look it up in a codex, you could talk to an NPC, and you'll get provided with what you need to know in order to have a deeper appreciation of what's going on. To illustrate what I'm saying, just consider the ending of Mass Effect 1. So in the end game of Mass Effect 1, uh, on Ilos, Shepard and their crew has a roughly 20 minute conversation with the VI known as Vigil, who explains to you who built it, who built the conduit, why you know the conduit works, how it works, um, how no one has figured out the Reaper's plans for millennia, right? And how the Protheans managed to keep the conduit a secret all of this time. Effectively, this is a smorgasbord of FAQs that the player is likely to have at this point in the story. And sure, some questions seem to be off limits. For example, Vigil explicitly tells you not to worry about what motivates the Reapers, but keeping some of these questions unanswered was compelling, probably, you know, for the sake of future games, right? But even without you having all of your questions answered, the questions that were answered gave you enough food for thought going into your final fight with Saren. It informed you of the stakes, the potential consequences of failure, and it gave you an overall deeper appreciation for the story. From a storytelling perspective, this is empowering because it gives you an interdiegetic or in-universe explanation. This is basically a fancy way of saying Watsonian if you've heard of that term. But basically you get an in-universe explanation that strengthens Shepard as a character. It gives Shepard the knowledge that they need in order to take on a new challenge. And from an extra diegetic or out of universe explanation, it gives you as the player, you know, evidence that the writers are taking the story seriously and that they put thought into what's happening. Um, effectively, the writers aren't just taking you off the street, putting a bag over your head and, and promising you that you're gonna go to Disney World, right? Instead, you're getting the right shotgun, you get to see where you're going, and you actually have, at least you, you feel like you have influence over where the story is going. Um, I don't really know where this analogy came from, but contrast this to the exposition we get from the Catalyst, right? The Catalyst is a pedantic character. It's didactic, it's paternalistic. The Catalyst is sort of like your mom telling you to eat what's on your plate or you're gonna go to bed hungry. Um, the Catalyst is a complete opposite of Vigil, and its introduction doesn't really tell us much beyond what we learned from the Leviathan DLC. Um, really, the only new piece of information that we get is that the Catalyst lives inside the Citadel. Everything else you get from Leviathan. And then the Catalyst goes on to tell you how it's been doing a great job of saving the galaxy, uh, eon after eon of genocide, right? And everyone else is an idiot for not really understanding why it's doing a good job. And then many of the dialogue options in this discussion with the Catalyst, they're effectively designed to disavow you of any sort of common sense observations that you would have formed from a straightforward playthrough of Mass Effect 3. For example, Shepard asked the Catalyst explicitly, you know, how is fighting the Reapers, how is this not war with synthetics, right? The synthetics, i.e. the Reapers, are raining down on every world and literally genociding everybody. And this is a good question, but the Catalyst responds with, Fire burns, fire burns. Effectively, a metaphor that is not very well thought out. Another question that you might have is, hey, how come you say that all of these synthetics are always rebelling, but 
really the only time they rebelled was when you intervened, right? I guess you could say, you know, the geth Quarian conflict is a perfect example of what the Catalyst is saying, but there is only one synthetic race in the galaxy. And the, I mean, aside from the geth Quarian conflict, the only time they attacked all organics, right? Like every single organic, as opposed to just their creators who attack them, um, was when the Reapers hijacked them, right? So like, this is kind of not a great example of what the Catalyst is trying to prove. It's kind of weird, you know, again, that if if this theme of synthetic versus organic conflict was so central to the series, it's kind of odd that in earlier entries, we don't have more evidence or even more species of, of synthetics and organics fighting throughout the trilogy. Um, it's, again, another indication that the ending is kind of not continuous with what came before it. Now, that's not to say that the writers do uh, no work trying to justify the Catalyst's existence. Throughout the entire campaign of Mass Effect 3, as you gather resources for the Crucible, you hear a lot of ambient dialogue implying that the Crucible is some sort of power source, and while no one knows what it'll do, it very clearly generates power for something that is very strong. Uh, but this is like the closest we get to the classic sense of, of world building uh, that is present in other Mass Effect games. It's kind of the bare minimum of what I would expect from a Mass Effect game, but I do want to acknowledge that obviously there's not nothing uh, in Mass Effect 3 kind of justifying the catalyst, but given how little there is and given how important the catalyst is to the story, um, there is a disconnect you know, for the audience trying to square the circle that is the catalyst within the story of the game. The consensus today seems to be that, you know, the catalyst works via space magic. Uh, this is space magic that is distinct from the titular mass effect fields that are uh, really part of what describe most of the phenomena in the series. And then ultimately the other conclusion is that the reasons for the catalyst uh, reasons <laughs> The reasons don't really matter, right? Because, well, you got to do what it says anyway. Now, admittedly, the Catalyst should not be the one providing all this information, or at the very least, it shouldn't be the only one shouldering the burden of giving us all this information. But unfortunately, the bug kind of stops with the Catalyst because there's really nothing else, no other character, no other codex entry, nothing to tell us about the Catalyst aside from its own defense of its logic. And so as a result, people find uh, the Catalyst has very bad dialogue right because they're expecting more ex explanation and at best they consider it vague at worst they consider it cringeworthy and for a franchise that's filled with primary and secondary codexes and whole forest of dialogue trees brimming with exposition it's just again jarring to have such a, a character in the franchise that behaves this way one of the reasons why I, I love the franchise is because it really scratches that part of my brain that gets excited talking about world building. Now, it's true that the Mass Effect franchise is not topping the charts of what science fiction fans would call most scale of hardness. Um, we could think of hardness basically of how realistic is this world in terms of science detail. I think TV Tropes puts uh, Mass Effect right in the middle of the scale at a four in terms of hardness. But stories of this type with Mass Effect's level four degree of hardness typically introduce what I call quasi plausible concepts. Um, for example, the idea of the Mass Effect field is a quasi plausible concept that is not real, but if you were to grant it were real, the writers do a very good job of implementing the Mass Effect field in such a consistent way that it kind of is a, a bit of science-y tech. Um, it's not Star Wars, right? But obviously this is not like the Dark Forest trilogy. So generally speaking, when it comes to Mass Effect's accuracy, the astronomy and the basic physics of Mass Effect are fairly accurate. You know, for example, a lot of the nebulas in the game, they're named after real places in the universe. The planets are fake, but the lore of the planets are detailed enough that they provide real information like orbital distances, lengths from their star, surface temperature, gravity, and all this detail kind of lets you actually imagine what stepping onto these planets would feel like. It's this level of detail that can make you go, you know, yeah, I can kind of see this happening, right? If if 
you were to grant the premises of Mass Effect's world, right? Um, now, if I'm being honest, the Catalyst is not the only time the world building of Mass Effect has been stretched. Um, for example, the issue of Shepard dying in Mass Effect 2 and then being resurrected is, is pretty ambiguous, partly because it's not clear if they burn up in the atmosphere of the planet where they were KIA. The name of the planet escapes me. But with the Catalyst, we're talking about understanding the mechanisms that allow us to defeat the primary villain, right? And so Shepard being resurrected is sort of required for the story to continue, uh, something that you have to grant. It's sort of like the price of admission for Mass Effect 2 to be a story. Uh, although you can argue maybe the writers shouldn't have wrote an uh, intro like that. But the Catalyst being the not only the primary antagonist, but being the central force that shapes Mass Effect's universe, not having information that helps us explain the Catalyst, again, makes it feel like it doesn't really belong in the world. All we really know from the main campaign of Mass Effect 3 is that the Crucible uses a fuck ton of power and that, you know, well, that's pretty much it. Some space uh, cuttlefish created a AI and, and somehow it thought genocide was a good idea. That's basically all that we're going to get out of this ending. Um, another reason why knowing how the catalyst works is important is... And this one, I think, is probably the most important reason why a lot of players kind of lost their suspension of disbelief. Having the knowledge of, of why the Catalyst works the way it does uh, would at least give players some sort of explanation as to why Shepard or Edie and the Geth have to die. And this allows for players to have closure when it comes to sacrificing these characters. Um, for example, many people have asked, why can't the Catalyst, who claims to be in control of the Reapers, why can't it just tell them to take a walk in the sun or to go into dark space forever? Why can't the Catalyst distinguish between the Reapers and, and other synthetics in the Destroy ending? And, you know, because in the Control ending, it apparently does, right? Like, if the Control ending and the Destroy ending were symmetric, I would expect Shepard to be inside of Edie, right? <laughs> that's just how that's, that would work, right? So in universe, it's not really clear why the Catalyst behaves this way. Now... Out of universe, it makes sense, right? The writers want to give you a, a tough choice, but they don't really do a lot of work justifying the forces in the world that make the choice have to happen this way. I understand that Mass Effect is not supposed to be a happy series, right? The villains are literally Robo Space Cthulhu, but simply saying the writers needed to add a tough choice and, and not trying to justify why it's happening in any meaningful way is not a great alternative. If all we're after is difficult choices, we might as well have an ending involving a mustachioed reaper tying down Shepard and Edie to railroad tracks and forcing us to choose which one to say because that makes just as much sense. And I understand it's a sacrifice, but players are also expecting closure. I think the fact that players were expecting this type of closure is again a testament to how well written these characters are. The extended cut obviously provides some of this, but without really understanding, you know, how the catalyst works, why it reasons the way it does, the trade-offs that we're forced to make between Edie, the Geth, Shepard, they really feel like nothing more than fiat. It's just the writers saying, well, that's the way it is, right? We want you to make a moral decision. And what this ends up doing is, because the decision is not really justified by any of the forces in the world, it kind of feels like it's actually not even a moral decision. It feels more like it's a choice between who you get to hang out with at the ending. But one thing worth pointing out here is that a more organic sacrifice, and we actually have quite a few examples of these in the series, specifically in Mass Effect 3, actually. There's a reason why, for example, no one really complains about Morden and, and Legion dying in their respective story arcs. There are genuinely strong narrative, strong lore reasons, strong just story-based reasons that make both of their sacrifices satisfactory from a variety of standpoints. I don't really want to do a, a tit-for-tat point-by-point comparison. I think that in its of itself would be an entirely different video. If you want to hear me talk about that, I could probably do that, but let me know in the comments. Anyway, as I said before, stories are shaped by their audience's expectations, and in role-playing space operas, declining to provide explanations is not in and of itself a bad thing, but if you're not going to do it, then there should be a good reason for it, right? And I feel given 
the details I've outlined so far, there's not really a good reason for this lack of information. So moving on to lore, it all do it. I didn't find the function the catalyst played in the story very well integrated into the, the series from a world building perspective. One of the things that I always just assumed was that there was at least some lore maybe that I'd never seen before hinting that the catalyst had a point about the inevitability of machine versus organic conflict. I didn't really bother to validate this assumption until I finished my second playthrough of the trilogy this year via my mods effect trilogy. Again, you can check out me playing a heavily modded version of mass effect in the link in the description. Anyway, seeding every planet with lore or adding codex entries about this lore probably are two of the easiest ways that Bioware could have softened the disconnect that players had when talking to the catalyst. But those aren't exactly the best way to do storytelling. Obviously, I would argue that's way better than nothing. But ideally, the story itself would have points that prove the catalyst is, you know, accurate or at least give the players some pause when talking to the catalyst. Regarding the lore, though, I wasn't expecting mountains of lore. I understand that in universe, archaeology is supposed to be very hard. And the Reapers are obviously suppressing history. They're actively trying to prevent people from learning about the past. But given the lore that we got, even the background lore about the Geth, right? None of this really supports the Catalyst point. It's worth noting that Extinction does come up quite a bit in a lot of entries, both in the games and in Extended Universe content. We know, for example, that there's at least one species that went extinct due to global warming. Another seven species are implied to have died out as a result of nuclear era level conflict before they even got into space and became spacefaring, both of which I hope don't happen to us. Some of my favorite extinction mysteries, as I call them, are ones involving targeted orbital bombardment um, of habitation centers. These are planets like Atahil, Laban, and Edemus. I'm not really sure if I'm pronouncing these correct, but these appear in both Mass Effect 2 and Mass Effect 3. And while we don't really know the cause of these attacks, they're somewhat consistent with Reaper attacks. For worlds that Reapers don't bother harvesting, like uh, Birkenstein, that's the colony that Diana Allers is from, that's exactly what the Reapers do. So you can imagine, for example, a hypothetical future cycle with knowledge of the Reapers looking at Birkenstein's surface and deducing that the destruction was caused by Reapers. And it's stuff like this that makes you realize that the Mass Effect universe is richer for having included mysteries like these, even if they're not explicitly solved. Unfortunately, we don't really get anything like this for the organic and synthetic conflict. The orbital bombardments are vague enough that you could argue, well, hey, you know, maybe it wasn't a Reaper that caused them. Maybe it was like another synthetic species or, or civilization. And it's plausible, but it seems likely that at least some of these were meant to illustrate that the Reapers do still leave their mark on the galaxy even if they actively try to suppress history. Now, Javik does provide us with some more context um, and extinctions through ambient dialogue, but based on his discussions, organic on organic conflicts seem way more common. Um, in one case, there's an entire species that's wiped out by another. I think it was a Zandomar and the Dutriel. I don't exactly know if I'm pronouncing those correctly. Aside from that, we've got the Metacon War, which is actually involving machines, but this is the only explicit machine conflict that Javid talks about, at least one not involving Reapers. There's another species called the Zatil uh, that Javik mentions, but the Zatil were synthetic organic hybrids that were hijacked by the Reapers in order to attack the galaxy. So again, not really proving the catalyst point, but the confusion for me is why didn't the writers try and incorporate more of this lore into the story? Because they did understand the importance of lore, that's why the Leviathan DLC exists. And that's why we got things, for example, like a billion year old cave painting illustrating the, the Leviathan's hold on the galaxy, right? Something like this is kind of absurd, but at the very least, it shows you that the writers are trying to justify their story. Of course, you know, this can be excessive. I think an, another example of a silly artifact is Object Row from Mass Effect 2 Arrival which apparently is like a calendar event that tells you when the Reapers are coming. Um, I know there's like some in-universe explanation about there being pulses to calculate the, the intervals. Um, but in terms of how this object would function independently of, of its purpose in the plot, 
it's kind of beyond me, right? So, you know, retconning lore in the wrong way can be kind of silly. But my point is, this is a trilogy that had a multitude of writers, right? So some amount of retconning was going to be acceptable to any sane person. Um, and it was likely going to be unavoidable. But had it been done well and with some forethought, I think the catalyst wouldn't have to point to off-screen evidence that we'll never have access to to prove its point. So now let's talk about theme. If it's not obvious, I think Mass Effect is about one thing and one thing alone. Uh, more seriously, so Mass Effect is mostly about working with other cultures to solve galactic problems, much like Star Trek. And I think from this, this theme emerges a bunch of different plot points. The most prominent ones are obviously how to address past harms to other cultures. I'm not going to pretend like the series has the most philosophically sophisticated take on this issue, but regardless of how you feel, it definitely is one of the through lines of the entire franchise. So Saren's forces consist mostly of species who experienced the worst atrocities in the galaxy, deserved or not. This includes the Geth, the Krogan, indirectly the Rachni are included here too, although they're not his frontline soldiers. But Saren uses these races, you know, for his own ends, but he indirectly provides them a flawed way of addressing their grievances. The Geth just want to improve their intelligence. The Krogan don't want to go extinct, right? And through Sovereign, both of these factions gain the power they need and the resources they need to achieve their goals. But in Mass Effect 3, you can act as a potential foil to Saren and provide actual genuine opportunities of self-determination for each of these groups and actual redemption by integrating them into the galactic community. So the Geth and Krogan were part of Saren's forces, but they can join you and your forces as equals in the galactic war against the Reapers. It's this thematic thread that really serves as a crux of what Mass Effect is. The other major theme, of course, of the franchise is the Reapers and being based on Lovecraftian horror um, and cosmic horror, the Reapers represent existential dread and the unknowable nature of the universe. But since Bioware obviously was not trying to create Dead Space, the other franchise that EA had about space monsters at the time, um, by necessity, a lot of Mass Effect's plot is driven by these issues of cooperation and interspecies relationships, right? These do most of the heavy lifting in the franchise. The Reaper plot is kind of interspaced between expedition and intergalactic drama that comes with trying to bring the galaxy together. Each game basically has a climax where the resources you gain throughout the story are used in the fight against the Reapers. So in Mass Effect 1, you know, obviously there's a looming threat of Sovereign, and this provides the urgency required for the player and therefore Shepard to reach out to other races. In Mass Effect 2, you build a squad consisting of characters from a variety of backgrounds and learn more about each of them in order to sway them to your side. And in Mass Effect 3, you solve problems for homeworld leaders in order to incentivize them to join the war effort against the Reapers. The structure worked mostly well, I think, especially in the first two games. Um, the Reaper plot gives us formidable antagonists to evolve over the course of each game. And then the collaboration-oriented story developments and, and themes, they bring us the means by which we actually fight the Reapers. So Shepard and the player learn and grow by doing the collaboration-oriented plots. And in turn, these experiences provides you and Shepard with the resources you need to defeat the Reapers. However, this results in the dialogue-centric and collaboration-driven themes and, and plot lines shaping most of the tone of the series. So what this means is that storytelling within the trilogy was always going to be a precarious balance between uh, keeping the Reapers interesting and maintaining these character-focused threads on cooperation and exposition and, and collaboration. So the question of how well you think the writers did across the trilogy is going to be a matter of how you view their balances between these two types of themes. Regardless, I think most of the shifts in its balance are responsible for what fans ultimately come to see as changes in the tone across the entire franchise. For example, in Mass Effect 2, we have a primarily character-driven story that dives into the psychology and history of the Normandy crew through recruitment and loyalty missions. This changes the scope kind of away from the Reaper plot. Mass Effect 2, in fact, has more missions about daddy issues than it does about the Collectors, who themselves are not the Reapers. They're like discount Reaper forces bargain bin reaper forces whatever you want to call them and they don't ever show up after the end of mass effect 2 and then this in and of itself is a shift from 
Mass Effect 1, which I think personally took a more balanced approach between uh, the Reaper plotline and the collaboration-oriented themes. Mass Effect 3 goes in the opposite direction. The Reaper plot, as the writers established it, had become much more urgent, which is why Bioware probably thought that building a game with the tone of Mass Effect 2 or even Mass Effect 1 was inappropriate. But the Reaper plot, at least the way it was written, was never meant to be in the driver's seat of the thematic storytelling elements of Mass Effect. I think this is really obvious if you think about it. If it's not, then just tell me what the hell this is supposed to be. This literally half-baked thing that is the final boss of the second game. Is it a freaking feed? Like, why? I, don't... I mean, seriously, the final boss of this game is a freaking a feed. What? So this is why the Crucible, you know, as a, a plot device exists in the third game. It, it exists because Shepard needs to gather allies and assets. Uh, even though it's a contravince, this is basically the way the writers get you to keep some semblance of plot lines that drove Mass Effect 1 and 2. So even as Bioware did things like add more auto dialogue to conversations and remove conversations in favor of ambient dialogue, you've got um, some semblance of that old style collaboration plot um, driving Mass Effect 3. But for whatever reason, in addition to this change, Bioware wasn't satisfied with the Reaper plot becoming urgent. They also wanted it to be the dominant driver of the, the themes of the story. Unfortunately though, in terms of themes, the Reaper plot, as I just said before, doesn't really provide us any. Um, it, it, part of the reason why that's the case is because there's a huge difference between Sovereign's plans and Harbinger's plans. I mean, presumably their ultimate goals, right? The things that they ultimately want to do are the same because they're Reapers, but their short-term objectives, they don't really relate at all. Success for the Collectors and Harbinger doesn't really help Sovereign and success for Sovereign makes the Collectors plans irrelevant. So the context of their plans are different. One plan, you know, only affects humans. The other plan affects the galaxy at large. Uh, the one thing that the plans do have in common is that the scope of, of both plans are small enough that they can be overcome through this sort of cooperation style plot, which is what I have been highlighting. And that's what enables Mass Effect to be Mass Effect. But even assuming the first two games were consistent in how they treated the Reapers, a plot where thousands of Reapers rain down on the skies of every home world at near full strength is the fail condition of the first game. This is basically the worst type of match for a Mass Effect style collaboration plot. Uh, the scope of the threat is simply too big to be overcome uh, with cooperation without really good writing and furthermore the writers hadn't really worked on the cosmic horror angle which was really the only theme associated with the reapers up to the point of mass effect 3 and a straightforward telling of this theme would probably be nowhere near as interesting as the themes touched on by the collaboration driven plot lines that the prequels had established and the character focus storylines so to solve this problem, the writers tried to tie the Reapers to a new theme, a theme of synthetic rebellion, which is kind of in the series a little bit, but not explicitly. But aside from being a cliche, um, the instances in which this theme appears in the earlier games is not very strongly supporting the way the writers use it in Mass Effect 3. To understand what I'm saying, let's look at how Mass Effect 1 and 2 frame the Morning War, which is the conflict between the Quarians and the Geth. So in Mass Effect 1, Shepard has several dialogue options that express the sentience of the Geth, and really, these dialogue options make no distinction between the harm that you can do the synthetics and the harms you can do the organics. You didn't really think they'd just let you destroy them without a fight, did you? The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines. What really kind of cements the point of view that I'm talking about is the fact that just both of these groups are part of Saren's team, by aligning them together, the story illustrates how similar uh, their histories are. We're invited to think about the ways in which they both became outcasts of the galaxy. The Geth, as we learned from Legion, just want to self-improve, and that was even the case for the heretics that joined Saren. But even without knowing this, you know what we learned directly from Tally in Mass Effect 1 is that the Quarians, they struck the Geth first. Regarding the Krogan, Sovereign is able to exploit the galaxy's general disinterest towards them, um, in order to create a program to secretly cure the genophage. Although the game is kind of weird about it. It calls it a cure, but it's just cloning, I guess. Um, anyway, 
the game's lore seems to imply that Saren was able to get the resources to do this uh, through Binary Helix by getting funding from special interest groups that I guess paid Binary Helix or Saren directly. Uh, and then Saren has actual Krogan, like Dr. Joyous, working for him out of genuine self-interest for preserving their species. Even Rex is almost swayed by the promise of Saren's cure. Um, given the galaxy's general inaction, addressing the concerns of outcasts like the Geth and you know the Krogan, basically it, it allowed someone like Saren to kind of come in and make promises that could have probably been patched by diplomatic channels. At least that's what the game seems to be implying, uh, given that Shepard can actually do this in Mass Effect 3 and, and make both of these groups part of the galactic community. And in this way, Mass Effect thematically links both the Geth and Krogan's uh, struggles to themes of self-determination and basically being able to own one's own future free from the past. It's a template that even applies to the Rachni to a smaller extent, despite their limited role in the series. And then Mass Effect 2 brings us Legion, who through its actions and its exposition provides example after example about how rigid organic and synthetic thinking kind of breaks down. Even the Geth culture, which is closer to a hive mind, has different factions. And similar to organics, these factions don't always agree. And sometimes they disagree uh, violently. Uh, this means that machine on machine conflict is at least implied to be as likely as organic on organic conflict. And so the framing you know, provided by Mass Effect 1 and 2 steer us away from the idea that the Geth and Corian conflict is one driven by some inherent difference between machines and organics. Yeah, it's true that machine and organic differences drove the Quarians to fear the Geth and to attack them, but Legion shows us that the differences that the Quarians thought were relevant were completely wrong. And then there's also just the fact that within all of these conflicts, you have different subsets of organics and synthetics not following along the lines you expect them to. There were, for example, organic uh, sympathizers in the Morning War, and then in the modern day Mass Effect story, there are Geth who don't agree with the idea of attacking organics. This is actually one of the things I thought made Mass Effect's world building far more interesting. It would have been very easy for Mass Effect 1 and Mass Effect 2 to simply say that, you know, hey, the Geth conflict is just a result of some inevitable value misalignment between machines and organics, which is obviously like a very common science fiction trope. But these games, they don't do that. The third game even, which tries to use the geth Corian conflict to prop up the idea of the Catalyst, you know, saying that these conflicts are inevitable, it doesn't actually succeed in doing this. Speaking of the third game, let's put aside the fact that the geth Corian piece is actually a possibility within the story. Um, let's look at the Rannoch arc as it's written. So basically a Shepard who has already allied with Legion can talk to Admiral Ron and provide evidence that the Geth are not hostile. However, Ron replies, I wish I could have known it better, but right now we cannot afford trust. This seems to suggest that the Quarians have already engaged in like a first strike policy because they think that the conflict is inevitable. Maybe they're thinking, you know, if not now, at some point in the future, you know, machines always rebel, right? But it's this way of thinking that actually ensures the conflict will continue. It's basically a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, you know, in self-defense, the Geth turn to the Reapers, as we know, for help. And this causes the conflict in Mass Effect 3. So what this shows us is that, at least as the writers have conceived of the world of Mass Effect, preemptively trying to solve the machine rebellion problem won't work. You know, if the Quarians actually commit to attacking the Geth and you don't stop them, there's only one of two options waiting for them. They either go extinct completely or they lose a valuable ally who could fight with them against the Reapers and improve their lives. So going back to theme and storytelling and writing, there's an adage called show don't tell. You've probably heard this a billion times, right? Writers should always illustrate what points they're trying to make as opposed to simply saying them. And the writers of Mass Effect don't do a very good job of showing machine conflict existing independently of the Reaper's influence. They do, in fact, show quite the opposite. It's almost like they're shooting themselves in the foot. So the present day cycle only has one machine race and the writers illustrate, you know, the vast majority of Geth were cleaning up Rannoch to assure that it remains habitable for the Quarians, almost like they're cute custodians, right? This is something that's, you know, implied in Mass Effect 2, and it seems like they're going out of their way to make the Geth sympathetic. As many fans have said, this is kind of eye-rollingly one-sided, um, despite the fact that Geth retaliation in the Morning War killed over 99% of Quarians, a more nuanced take on this issue would obviously have been welcome, and presumably a more nuanced take on the Geth-Korean conflict 
would have not contradicted the catalyst in every way imaginable. But unfortunately, we didn't get that story. And so as fans have pointed out, the catalyst words and arguments don't really line up to what the story is illustrated. But let's put all this aside. Let's say for the sake of discussion that I'm missing something here and that the writers do a good job of integrating machine versus organic conflict. And let's just say that, that this theme is is central to Mass Effect. Is the ending thematically consistent with this? No, I don't think so. In part because the Catalyst Toolkit is very coercive. It's like the equivalent of trying to cure cancer with a nuclear bomb. Um, and you know, even if the audience agrees with the Catalyst points, there's really little reason in universe to expect these options to work. So the destroy ending, you know, kills off all synthetics. I guess preemptive genocide is one way to prevent future conflict. Hashtag Thanos did nothing wrong. Uh, balance as all things should. Um, but assuming that the Geth stay dead was to stop AI from being built in the future. Only this time, there's no catalyst to murder everybody for their own safety. And the catalyst actually suggests this. It says um, basically exactly this point. Yes, but the peace won't last. Soon, your children will create synthetics and then the chaos will come back. So what's the point of preemptively genociding a whole uh, species that we've established has sentience in order to solve a problem that doesn't exist yet, that would only be prolonged for a generation if it did? Like, why is this even being offered as a solution? It's not a solution. It's not even a stopgap, right? Uh, justifying this doesn't really seem to be a concern for the catalyst or anybody involved here. So it's like an indication to me that at least this theme was kind of tacked on at the end. Now, regarding synthesis, I can vaguely kind of see how it might solve the problem. Synthesis would allow organics to achieve parity with the uh, with machines, right? In terms of function and ability, they'd have the same or similar skills. You know, machines can evolve indefinitely, while organics are still subjected to the laws of evolution. So synthesis kind of removes this distinction. It allows machines to gain emotion, uh, allows organics to continue to evolve um, without needing the forces of evolution. And um, presumably this would mean that they would get along better because they would understand each other better. But what happens when new machines are built, right? Either by species that we don't know or species that have not yet been discovered. I'm assuming, you know, that these machines won't benefit from the fusion. Like is synthesis something that has to be done every few centuries or millennia? Or is synthesis just like gonna happen automatically for any new machines that are built? Like there's like a, a synthesis force in the universe that just permeates the entire universe of Mass Effect. Like, I don't exactly know what's happening. Like, when you build a new machine, are the metals going to be different from the metals that you used historically? I mean, I don't even know what I'm trying to ask, but I'd really like to know what's going on. Like, it's worth noting, too, the Callus tells us that synthesis was tried before. So it's clearly attached to the idea, but it failed. And I think knowing why it failed would be at least somewhat relevant for a Shepard deciding to choose synthesis for the first time. And so finally, we come to the control ending. Uh, yeah, it's true that this puts Shepard in charge, but I don't think anything has changed. Um, if conflict between synthetics and organics is completely inevitable, as the Catalyst keeps suggesting, what are the Sheepers going to do if there's more conflict? Like, are the options that the Sheepers have different from those of actual Reapers? Uh, if not, then Shepard is going to have to harvest the aggressors or enforce peace through indoctrination. Um, there's not much to indicate here that this is actually a solution. We know that Shepard has different values than the machine, but this machine is also not Shepard. It's just a machine that's been influenced by Shepard. And there's no reason to assume that giving this machine with Shepard's values the genocide button at the center of the conflict is actually a great idea. We could actually, in fact, tell a story, maybe even a more interesting story, where the Catalyst was actually an organic who took the control option from the previous Catalyst in order to save their cycle and found out they had to resort to the exact same behaviors as the original AI. And so this brings us to a bit of an impasse. Uh, these endings aren't satisfying on the basis of the theme that they're supposed to solve. Um, and destroy the catalyst basically admits this to us it doesn't really solve the problem in control you keep the reapers around as enforcers and you really don't have any other options other than the options the reapers had and in synthesis we're told that it failed before and we're not really given reasons as to what would make it a successful attempt this time i understand that none of this really 
matters at the end of the day because I think all of us just want there to be an ending for this franchise. Uh, and this idea of a synthetic uprising, it came so late that most people really only judge the endings on whether or not they stop the Reapers. And to be fair, they totally do, right? But it's just bizarre that, that this is done at the expense of previously established you know, lore and previously established themes like self-determination and cooperation. Like these endings very clearly encourage you to make decisions that unilaterally violate the autonomy of many of the species you've worked with, like the Krogan and the Geth. Is this inherently bad? No, not really. I mean, you could tell a story where these trade-offs are actually meaningful, but in in this story, right, in this ending, what are the trade-offs in service of? Are there deeper themes that Mass Effect is is providing? Is Mass Effect saying something more interesting by having you do all this? Not really. As I said before, the decisions are not really tough moral decisions. They're hard personal choices. The tension comes solely from the fact that Destroy kills Edie and the Geth, and every other choice kills Shepard, right? So this really isn't a question about what's right or what's wrong. It's more of a question of who you want to hang out with in Extended Cut, which in and of itself is not a very interesting moral question. And the writers don't really give us a way of even morally evaluating the decision on future playthroughs, right? This makes the trade-offs feel like they don't really matter in the long run because all you're given are flavor texts with slight variations in who appear inside of them. Uh, if, if the writers were fully committed to this theme of solving machine conflict, then each ending could have been literally a natural experiment showing us why the catalyst was right or wrong. For example, um, how do endings where the Geth are still around differ from endings where the Geth aren't around, right? Are those worlds better or worse, right? If organic and machine conflict are inevitable, then how does Shepard prevent conflict in the control ending? These are genuinely very interesting questions that if you know we were committed to understanding these themes, we would want to know. But instead, we kind of get uh, a samey ending that guarantees that Shepard is right regardless of which choice they make. And every ending basically has everyone living in peace but certain groups aren't around for some of these endings, right? That's the only major difference. So in this way, the endings aren't really satisfying even with respect to the theme that they're supposed to be about. Um, this is why some people have suggested that the Refuse ending makes the most sense. If you're role-playing a Shepherd who doesn't have any other knowledge besides what the Catalyst is saying, then none of these options should sound like complete solutions. Also, choosing Refuse calls back to an important lesson that Legion and the Geth learn, and it's a lesson that honestly the galaxy learned after the Rachni Wars when they had uplifted the Krogan. Um, the lesson effectively is intervening in other civilizations' trajectories can have disastrous, unintended consequences. Legion basically says as much in a dialogue session in Mass Effect 2. The old machines offer to give us our future. The Geth will achieve their own future. What difference does it make how you acquire a certain technology? Technology is not a straight line. There are many paths to the same end. Accepting another's path blinds you to alternatives. Nazara, Sovereign, said this itself. Your civilization is based upon the technology of the mass relays, our technology. By using it, your society develops along the paths we desire. So accepting the refuse ending would allow for the rise of a civilization that could beat the Reapers conventionally and not be strong-armed into choosing a, a path selected by the Catalyst. It would be a galaxy that is truly capable of self-determination and independence from the past or, or outside cultural influences, which again is in line with the themes that the series has effectively shown us. The cost, of course, is very high. Uh, everyone dies. But given that the future literally includes the rest of time, it contains vastly more people than, than the present does. It's the same calculus, the same trade-off that the game asks players to make when choosing between Shepard and a Geth. Only this time, it's in service of an actual theme established across all three games. But I don't think writers intended for Refuse to be the best ending, right? The simplest explanation for why the ending is like this is extra diegetic, it's out of universe. The writers really had difficulty managing the stakes of the Reaper plot. The Catalyst, unfortunately, is the only character capable of stopping the Reapers. And in order to add stakes back to the story, it has to defeat the Reapers, but in a way that doesn't make it too obvious. That's the only purpose it serves. So naturally, the solution is to have it solve an entirely different set of problems and remove the Reapers in a roundabout way. So let's talk about the final point here, uh, narrative. 
one of the biggest complaints about the ending is that people say Shepard doesn't really have any agency. And a big question people ask is, you know, why, why are you saying this? Right. And, you know, are, are you even right about that? Well, let's take a step back and talk about what the catalyst is. As I said before, the catalyst is a deus ex machina. It's a godlike character. And unfortunately it's introduced in the last 10 minutes of the franchise uh, for a trilogy playthrough that takes up, you know, maybe 90 hours, about 30 hours per game. This is like one one thousandth of screen time. And yeah, it's true that the catalyst was mentioned throughout all of Mass Effect 3, but the way it's introduced is as a MacGuffin or a plot device that drives the narrative. But MacGuffins don't always become deus ex machinas. Um, this type of character definitely feels like it doesn't belong in an interactive sci-fi story where the agency is assumed to rest with the player. Uh, I think the writers realize this, so they try their hardest to hand wave the power and agency of the catalyst via its backstory. Oh, it's not a character, it's a rogue program. It's bound to crappy code. And you know, as a result of this, it's just executing your choice, right? The implication is that Shepard is ultimately the one in control here because they're telling the catalyst what to do with his power. But this is kind of a conceit. The catalyst is an independent intelligence, kind of like Edie. You know, just because it's misaligned, just because it has bad reasoning, doesn't mean that it shouldn't have agency, right? Are villains who are wrong about the reasons why they are doing stuff, are they devoid of agency too? Like if Darth Vader has bad motivations for going to the dark side, is Darth Vader now less of a human or less of an agent? I don't really think that's right, right? So the player wouldn't really be mistaken for conceiving of the Catalyst as simply another character, you know, with its own goals, as opposed to a broken machine. So since there's really a lot of good reasons to think of the Catalyst as a character and not just a plot device or a, an object, there's a lot of ambiguity about its motivations. Is it telling the truth? Are we supposed to take it at its words? I think the writers want the response to these questions to be yes, right? But for the reasons I pointed out in all the other sections of this video, this feels discontinuous with everything that came earlier in the trilogy. And this is obviously extremely important for maintaining suspension of disbelief. You know, with all this in mind, the ending really only makes sense if you think of the Catalyst as the protagonist of the story, at least for the last few minutes of the game. Because at the end of the day, the Catalyst is the one who has the power to put it into the war, and Shepard doesn't. Shepard is not an equal partner here. Shepard is not having a battle of wits with the Catalyst. Shepard can't shape the Catalyst. Shepard can't really even build the Catalyst, right? Shepard has really no relationship to this entity. No special knowledge that makes Shepard's present essential. So if the Catalyst is understood best as an independent character with its own perspective and its own motives, then in the final moments, for whatever reason, Shepard has been reduced to being nothing more than a means for the Catalyst to achieve its goals. This is why people have complained they felt like they didn't have any agency or why their choices didn't matter. Shepard's role in the ending is nothing more than one of opportunity. Shepard happens to be the one that stumbled upon the beam of the Citadel at the end of Priority Earth. And, you know, Shepard happens to make it to the chamber and outlive Anderson, right? All these things are things that are not directly in Shepard's control. And to illustrate how completely interchangeable Shepard is with any other character, let me tell you the most absurd story I can think of. <clears throat> so the year is 2186. Shepard's under house arrest for destroying the Alpha Relay, but Shepard requests to speak to Alliance. Shepard then meets with Anderson who promises to pass on their request. So Shepard says, hey Anderson, you know what's coming, right? We need all the help we can get. The Reapers are here, and Anderson asks, you know, what do you propose, Shepard? And Shepard says some BS about the troops need a leader to motivate them, and that Shepard can't be in every place at once. They knew somebody who could be, you know, both a leader and face down danger, and, and somebody who fought Reapers before. But this person, they were left behind on Vermeer, unfortunately. So basically what I'm proposing is that Shepard asks Anderson to tell the Alliance to initiate a second Lazarus project to resurrect the other Vermeer squad mate um and they would argue you know hey it's more valuable than even a quarter of the fleet given that this person has you know enormous potential and they fought reapers or at the very least they fought some early ground reaper forces like husk um so let's just assume that this insane scenario is a thing and alliance agrees and the alliance actually does this and instead of shepherd going down uh the final run to the conduit um it's the Vermeer, um, I guess they're not the Vermeer Samire, but the, the Vermeer uh, squad mate who died. Um, so this person, 
somehow makes it to the beam and Shepard has to go back to the Normandy with uh, whoever else didn't make it, right? I know this idea is insane, right? I actually spared you the version of the story where I was going to revive Jenkins, who died on Eden Prime. But, you know, I made this story as crazy as possible to illustrate the point that it doesn't really matter who ends up going to see the catalyst. The interaction is the same. The results the same. Everything is actually the same. So, um, by the way, if any modders are listening to this, please, please, please try and make Jenkins a character in Mass Effect 3. I just, I just want this joke to have a punchline. Uh, anyway, my point is that anybody could have gone to the Catalyst. Anybody could have made those choices. We can, in fact, tell a, a more grounded version of Mass Effect 3's story that begins with a Shepard who remained an Alliance lifer. So just imagine there's a version of Shepard you know, who didn't become a Spectre, who didn't fight Saren or the Collectors, and the Shepard just happens to be stationed on Earth where they happen to enter the beam, and they're given the same exact choice by the Catalyst. Nothing really changes. This decision you have at the end of the game has no narrative connection to any of Shepard's experiences in the trilogy. Um, in fact, had Anderson lived in the ending that we got, I'm almost certain Anderson would be the one making the sacrifice, right? So this is effectively a choice of opportunity as opposed to being any choice connected to the actions or the narrative story of the character making the decision. So from a storytelling perspective, Shepard's absence obviously makes no significant difference as I'm pointing out. Uh, there's no skill or ability that Shepard needs in order to access the Citadel. There's no reason that necessitates that Shepard is the only one who can talk to the Catalyst. The Catalyst is just a genie and anyone could rub a genie's lamp, right? So given that these endings don't really even explore the consequences or moral implications of your decision, uh, combined with the fact that, you know, Shepard is completely interchangeable in the ending, it just makes this ending feel completely, as I said, jarring and disjunctive from from the rest of, of not only Mass Effect 3, but from the rest of the trilogy. So those are the four reasons I think best demonstrate why Mass Effect 3's ending is not satisfying. Um, obviously, an analysis like this is to some degree going to be subjective. I've tried my best to identify structural issues that I think very broadly encompass the complaints that I see fans talk about. Anyway, I, I hope that you uh, learned something today or in, enjoyed the video. Um, if you didn't learn about anything, not writing or anything else, maybe you learned about someone else's point of view, but feel free to share your thoughts in the comments about whether you agree or disagree with my points. Anyway, until next time, Mikamu out.